Good evening, friends. I'm Dr. Ajay Shah, and today I'm excited to bring a special guest. I know our guest for many, many years. Recently, he actually moved away and left us alone in Michigan, but definitely we miss him. We're going to learn so many things from him. He's a learned man. He's a wise man. He actually, uh, he actually has been a, a great exercise phys uh, physical person. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get a first update on our page. We are now about 85,000 followers from all over the world. We are also on YouTube. We are also on Instagram. My wife has started uh, showing some live demonstration of uh, healthy cooking. So please tune in for that also. And let's talk about our guest today. Our today's guest is Frank Siminski. Like I said, he's a leader. He's an army veteran. He's a staunch supporter of Second Amendment. He's a martial arts practitioner. And uh, he's a great friend. So let's welcome Frank. Welcome, Frank. Hi, how to do, Dr. Shaw? How are you doing again? That's I'm the doing great, great thing here. I'm doing great. We definitely I miss you. you. We definitely, we all miss you. <laughs> it's hot down here. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, uh, tell us, where do you live now? I live in, uh, I live on the uh, South Carolina, Georgia border. It's a beautiful uh, retirement. And we're going to talk about that word retirement in just a few minutes. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go with being young and feeling young. But uh, we're on the South Carolina, Georgia border. It's, a, it's called Savannah Lakes Village. And uh, it's, a, it's a series of, if you think about six neighborhoods, uh, each with its own individual character. And the homes here are beautiful and they're, it's kind of the anti-villages in Florida where all the houses are on top of each other and you're living with 250,000 of your best friends. So, you know, this is uh, certainly very quaint down here. It's very nice and everybody's laid back. It's an active community. So people are, you know, you know on walkers and not, I'm not, you know, besmirching that or anything, but, uh, uh, you know, people are very active. They've lived uh, their work lives. We've got nothing left to prove. Uh, we all come from someplace else. So many Dr. Shah down here are from Michigan, believe it or not. You know, so it's, it's, I'm not a golfer, but you know, sometimes I'll go to the patio uh, at the river grill here and I'll, I'll have some iced tea and a, a burger with some friends and I'll see golf carts passing by with Michigan State University pennants flying from the side of it, you know? So I just can't get away from the go green, go white thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. So uh, definitely where did you grow up and who influenced you in your childhood? I was born in New York, New York City. And uh, my first memories are, you know, fine ones from the city. I lived there for five years, over five years. And then my parents, because of my father's job, uh, moved to New Jersey. And so I was raised in central New Jersey. And I went to schools there, public schools there. And uh, I guess they felt sorry for me. And I graduated high school, never knowing that I was going to be a high school teacher someday. So God has a way of getting even with us, right? But, uh, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, I had some key influences and, you know, I think, for instance, uh, of my fifth grade teacher, Elsie Bamer, and uh, prior to fifth grade, I was you know, very ADD, ADHD, kind of, you know, excitable and running around, I had a lot of energy. Today, we know how to handle these things, you know, we, our, our teachers are more specialized. So, you know, teachers, you know, saw me probably as a problem kid and everything else and they, they were going to fix my wagon, by golly. They were going to send me to Mrs. Bamer. Mrs. Bamer's mean. She'll get a handle on this guy, right? And uh, she turned out to be one of the nicest teachers I ever had. And I called her. She's passed now. And I called her about a year before she, she passed away. And, uh, and I told her, I said, you, don't, you probably will never remember me, but I remember you. And uh, I told her how much she meant to me and how as a student, she changed me and gave me confidence and, and told me that, like we all should hear as kids, that we matter, you know. Uh, other influences were, uh, uh, I have a, a, a friend, there's a friend of my father's and uh, our two families kind of grew up uh, together. His name was Steve, but I never called him Steve, Dr. Shaw. He was always Uncle Steve to me and he took, a, uh, he knew I liked baseball, so he played catch with me and he took me to ball games uh, in New York. Uh, 
you know, we, I just felt so at home with my uncle Steve. And I know his daughter, Elizabeth, she lives in North Carolina now. She'll probably see this podcast. So Liz, this is a shout out for you, Liz Clark. And, and uh, love to your, your mom and dad who means so much to me. And lastly, my football coach, coaches and other coaches in high school who instilled, I think, a sense of responsibility, a sense of discipline and taking the harder right instead of the easier wrong. Because now it's not about you. It's about the person to your left and the person to your right. And, and you've got to look out for each other. And I think that that was a really good discipline to learn. No, I think uh, I agree. I think uh, so many people leave us a great influence. And I think our character builds on those influence and those, uh, those things we learn from them. And I think uh, knowing you, seeing you, the way you teach your friends, your neighbors, your students, your family, I think reflects that you are influencing people. So I think uh, I'm glad that they influence you. And uh, I mean, yeah, this is a this is a just a you know great thing to go through. So my next question, which is like the most important question, you have partly told me about it, but we all want to hear about your service in the army, the way you were stationed in Berlin, because you told me the whole story about. It. So please <laughs> go in as detail as you can, because that's not only very exciting to hear, but also very very big gratitude for all your services. So please tell us. Well, you know, I, I my service is, uh, you know, I grew up in the Army. I think the Army kind of made me a man and it opened up a lot of possibilities for me that would not have been uh, necessarily available, at least during the time age-wise, you know, that most people are going to college or, you know, whatever, you know, like that. So my um, late, going into my 20s and whatever, you know, I, I like to think that the military kind of saved my butt, you know, and uh, and I, I, you have to grow up. And I think a lot of the, the folks that I know who, who went through that would totally agree with me. Um, and uh, I was uh, an enlisted soldier in military intelligence for eight years. And I had uh, a variety of very technical jobs, uh, uh, myself and the people with whom I worked and worked under. We all had top secret, above top secret clearances. So the information that uh, we were exposed to at a very young age, really the responsibilities that we were given, uh, when I look back on that, on those times, you know, I'm, I'm just blown away how we were able to do that and the responsibility that all us young kids at that time, uh, how we handled it. And we all handled it very well, <coughs> excuse me. And, uh, but, you know, we can talk about goals in a few minutes. I'm very goal oriented. I, goals drive me. They really amp me up. And when I have a goal, uh, I feel like a, like a pit bull trying to get to it. And uh, my goal was to earn not just my college degree, uh, but my commission as an army officer. And uh, so I went to school on my own time and uh, we were on rotating shift, and so I would trade, I would work back-to-back -back shifts, eight, nine-hour shifts, just for the joy of taking a final exam that night with no sleep in 36 hours, you know, but that's, that's just what you do, right? We, you know, you went through medical school, we all have to, you know, do our things, and uh, so anyway, long story short, I uh, graduated from Rutgers in New Jersey. I guess they lowered their standards when they let me in. And, uh, uh, and I earned a regular army commission. So lo and behold, uh, after my officer basic course, and you know there was another class after that then in Arizona, I was assigned to Berlin. And I had a, uh, a myriad of jobs there, you know, in, in uh, systems acquisition, and uh, I was a watch officer at an operations facility. Uh, my one of my mentors, I had two military mentors uh, who were officers, and uh, John Sharp, uh, who was one, and uh, Winston Bubba Pasha, my NCO mentors over the years. I've had them. Uh, uh, I became a company commander, and after my time in command. Uh, I transferred to the office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence for the U.S. Command in Berlin. And uh, I was a plans officer at first there, Dr. Shah. So 
Uh, Berlin is a, was a unique situation. It's a city uh, at that time that was in the middle of a communist country, East Germany, 110 miles inside of East Germany, and uh, which was under the influence and the arm, strong arm of the Soviet Union. And Berlin itself was divided uh, via the Potsdam agreements into four sectors. So what was then East Berlin was controlled by the Soviets and the Western uh, side of the city was controlled by uh, the three sectors containing the, the French in the North, the British in the, in the central part and the Americans below in the Southern sector. And uh, so uh, as a plans officer, I was always focused on what, how would we respond to a Soviet attack on Berlin? So I was asked on a couple of occasions uh, by the uh, commanding general if I could write the opposing forces, or op four, if you will, uh, a scenario by which uh, they would commence an attack on the city. And uh, so being a student of history and, you know, uh, and certainly a military historian at that time even, <clears throat> I, I knew that unconventional war uh, was what we had to prepare for. And uh, so the plan that I drew up to make a long story short really uh, gave our decision makers in command post exercises, if you will, uh, gave them some really good challenges. And I felt very happy that they were pleased with what I did. The last job that I had was, I was also in charge of what we call uh, reconnaissance. Now there were two types of reconnaissance. Uh, one was on the ground. Uh, in which we had access by our rights in Berlin to the Soviet sector. And in the Soviet sector, East Berlin, we were able to uh, go around to various places and look for, this is all unclassified now, uh, look, for, look at their equipment. Uh, we certainly were not allowed to drive onto their installations, but if they had a, uh, a national day parade or something and they would trot their surface to air missiles and their artillery and their tanks and you know their their goose stepping soldiers and everything else so uh the people who were uh for me were armed with some of the most sophisticated cameras and uh we had some really sharp top-notch analysts so we were always uh, looking for new equipment and uh, different types of uh, uh capabilities and oftentimes uh, we would be there overnight and that's when it really kind of got dangerous the other part was uh, aerial reconnaissance. And this is where the Berlin Wall thing comes in. Um, we, uh, West Berlin was surrounded by a wall, the Berlin Wall, which went up in 1961. And by the time that I became the officer in charge of the OIC of uh, the reconnaissance, 78 uh, would-be escapees from East Berlin had been killed trying to get through that wall. There was a, a wall on the East German side. There was a death strip in the middle with the guard towers. There were dog runs, there were mines. And then there was the final wall that you had to negotiate to actually get into uh, West Berlin. So it was really, uh, the odds against you making it were, were awfully, awfully difficult. It was hard. So anyway, uh, as we got towards November of 1989, most of the communist countries in Eastern Europe, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, were starting to experience like Lech Walesa in Poland and uh, in, down in uh, uh, Havel, Vlachlech, Vaclav Havel in Czechoslovakia and, and in Hungary, they were experiencing a renaissance of freedom. And, and uh, this was a time in Eastern Europe when uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was the, uh, was the general secretary. And uh, he and Ronald Reagan were negotiating uh, SALT, uh, not SALT, START agreements, and we were limiting uh, strategic and tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. And it really seemed, Dr. Shah, <clears throat> excuse me, that tensions really had a, a, a good shot of easing up. So that having been said, in East Germany, under the leader there, who was a stalwart communist, Erich Honecker, uh, he was a holdout. And by golly, he was gonna have nothing of it. 
uh, and he was going to demonstrate just how the hard line he could be. So the weekend before the wall, it didn't physically come down. It came politically came down. But the weekend before Dr. Shaw, there was a huge demonstration that was uh, uh, to take place in the main square of East Berlin. It's called Alexanderplatz. And there were anywhere from 250 to 300,000 guesstimation uh, from our sources who would probably be attending. But we did not know what we were going to see there. Well, uh, we had a UH-60 uh, Huey helicopter. One of our aerial missions was flying the entire length of, you know, the circumference of the wall around the western part of the city. We did that, you know, four or five times a week. Most of the times, Dr. Shaw, it was boring. Nothing was happening. But now things are heating up. And uh, when we threw, when we threw, when we flew uh, through the center part of the city and looked out the side over the wall where we can clearly see all the, this humongous gathering of people. What most people don't know is that we saw for blocks on end, ambulances lined up end to end to end. So this is human intelligence, the aerial reconnaissance is human intelligence. So intelligence consists of a whole bunch of pieces that you put together. So we're just one piece. And uh, so we were expecting the worst. Well, thank God, nothing happened. And things kind of got quiet. And then a few days later, a day before Thanksgiving, uh, we went up on what we call our fixed wing mission. We had a, a fixed wing uh, plane and uh, a pilot who was dedicated to that plane. And uh, we would overfly Soviet and East German installations, airfields, training areas, just checking on the state of their readiness and everything. Well, because this was a time of peace and seemed like peace was looming, nothing was happening. It was deader than the cemetery, right? So uh, I went back to our headquarters because the next day was Veterans Day, an American holiday. So uh, the command gave everybody off that next day, right? I scrubbed, <laughs> I scrubbed our missions for the next day, never thinking what was going to happen that night, right? So I got all the messages to the US European Command and DI, Defense Intelligence Agency, all these people, right? And think, okay, anything happens, give me a buzz, right? right well, phone never rang that night. And the next morning, it didn't ring, my God. The next morning I wake up and Aaron, you know, Aaron, our son, was a few months old. So he wanted a bottle. So Martha went downstairs to get him a baby you know, formula or whatever. And I turned on the TV and Armed, For <laughs> Armed Forces Network had satellite, you know, so we were watching TV from six hours behind us. So it was evening here in the States. And I, I kind of, I'm an early riser. So I clicked it on and I see Tom Brokaw from NBC News. And then I click on it, there's Dan Rather from CBS and Peter Jennings from ABC. And they're standing in front of the Brandenburg Gate and Berliners are on the wall on top of the wall behind him. And they're cheering and there's people were you know, taking chisels through the wall. And, and I'm, I'm sitting here looking, you know, I'm pinching myself like this, right? So it's like, I can't, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I scrubbed the missions. <laughs> we had no coverage of what was going on. We're the only people who can get this. So I frantically made some phone calls to the on-call officer at Temple Hall Air Base and a uh, good friend of mine. And, and he said, and he's now a general incidentally. And he said, Frank, I'll call you back in, in a few. He said, just hang tight. So he calls me back, Dr. Shaw, and he says, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> he said, you know what pilots, they play hard and they, and they party hard. Well, the pilots were on the Kerferstendam with the revelers, you know, the, the main drag, and, and they were bombed. He could not find a pilot. They were all, you know, pilots party hard for the most part, but they're great at their jobs. So I'm thinking, oh my God. So Martha comes into the bedroom. She goes, what's happening? She goes, I told her, and she goes, you're gonna be a part of history today. And I said, I'm gonna be eating my captain's bars today. So uh, anyway, he found a pilot 
And this pilot, Bill Inman, he was a warrant officer. I'll never forget him. I'll love him to the day I die. He was uh, from the Church of Latter-day Saints. He was a Mormon. And good old Bill was in bed that night earlier. You know, he's probably asleep by 10 o'clock and just a straight shooter. And he gives me a call and he says, meet me at some you know, predetermined place. And, and we were able to, to get our stuff. And uh, it was a long day. It was a cold day. And so we did the border flights on our helicopter. And it was freezing, doors open on both sides. I don't know how helicopters fly to this day. And, uh, uh, and then after two and a half hours on the helicopter and stopping and hovering over every checkpoint, every in encroachment in the wall, then we went to the air base at Templehof and we got on our fixed wing and we had to, to go around. And what was good, Dr. Shaw, and I included this in my report, uh, was that it's funny how messages are sent. And it's not by what you say oft times, it's by what you do. And uh, when we flew over their garrison areas, they made sure that we saw that all their tanks were lined up in their motor pool areas. They were nowhere near being used or they were not gonna be used. They were not gonna be going out to play in their training areas or anything else. Uh, all their military hardware <coughs> was neatly lined up in hangers or wingtip to wingtip. So the message was, the game is over, it, it's over. And, uh, and so we, we brought that back uh, and sent out our reports and that was how that day went. I'll never forget it. <clears throat> no, I think uh, what you describe, obviously, you know, some of us only read about it and some of us only kind of admired what you provide to our country. And I think all of our followers, viewers, all my friends, family, everybody is so much in depth with a person like you with all the military officers in all the branches, all the veterans and even their families, you know, their family also sacrifice such a large amount because you never know what's going to bring next hour when you are in military. And I think I actually consider uh, and again, I'm going to say something. I consider military people and teachers as equal to any other profession, including doctors, including nurses, as equal, if not higher. And it's pretty ironic that you've been both, you've been into military and you've been a teacher. So you actually have gone beyond even a doctor can go. Doctor is typically in one field and saves lives and you know, obviously does well, but you have gone through two major, major discipline of our society, being a military officer and being a teacher. So let's bring the next topic. You worked as a teacher for many years. So please tell us how many years you worked as a teacher and tell us your experience as a teacher. And if you remember one or two instances where you actually you know, remember a student who you kind of helped out and made sure the student uh, did well. So please tell us about being a teacher. I, uh, <clears throat> I think, first of all, if I could just go back to the military for just one second. I, I don't think Dr. Shaw, I did anything special. Um, I just worked with a whole bunch of really, really super talented men and women. Uh, I worked for some, under some great people, uh, a colonel, a full colonel who gave me my, my command and a major, uh, Larry Errol, who uh, lives in Fenton, Michigan. Uh, so, you know, I've been to see him and, and you know, Gary Phillips, I, there are so many people, Dr. Shaw, who took a chance on me, you know, and, uh, you know, I started out in 1972 as a lowly, lowly private. You know, I didn't know my rear end from a gopher hole. And here I am now given all this responsibility at the culmination of my career. So I, I owe so much to the people with whom I work and who I work for. Teaching uh, can, sort of comes naturally in a sense that if you've ever been uh, in front of a lot of people and as a commander, I was. Um, and I, I really enjoyed being in front of people, not like, hey, look at me but I just love being around them. I love trying to uh, do things to make their lives better. And, you know, we got a job to do and by golly, you lead by example. And uh, I think as a teacher in a classroom who is a dyslexic, I am dyslexic, uh, who was ADD, ADHD, who, 
you know, went through somewhat of a, a rocky childhood. Uh, I could identify with the kids I was teaching. So I taught for 22 years. I started out in Texas. And when we moved up to uh, uh, Michigan in 96, uh, I got a job uh, working at Lansing Everett uh, High School. And uh, uh, I uh, took a master's degree from Michigan State in special education. And you know, when I think about it, you know, it, you know everybody thinks that what they see on the surface with people, everything is so great, but um, I had a learning disability. And and, uh, you know, perseverance and like my fifth grade teacher there, I've had a lot of people along the way who gave me that boost, you know, uh, but uh, I had such an affinity for these kids in special education, I could identify with whether they had a learning disability or whether they had emotional impairment. Um, you know, what is their home background? What, what are they dealing with? You know, you only have, you know, as a kid coming into my class, you only see me, see me for 55 minutes a day. So that leaves uh, 23 hours that I'm not around you. So I, I can only give them the best for the time that I had with them. And uh, whether it was in special education or later on at uh, Lansing Everett, I moved back into general education. And I had like, my God, 180 something kids at least a day I was seeing. So, uh, you know, it was almost like that show. I, have you ever heard that show, Welcome Back, Cotter? It was, no, back, it, it was back in the 1970s. And this guy, uh, Gay Pat Kaplan, played this guy, Cotter. And, and he was one of the kinds of people he was teaching. And he came back to his old neighborhood and, and uh, you know, the, he had a bunch of rabble rousing teenagers and whatever, and they would always try to pull the wool over his eye and he was always kind of one step, and, but they loved each other. And, and I think Dr. Shaw, that this is the relationship I had with my students, that uh, it was very close. And I think that kids can read you. They know when you're given a, a BS and, uh, and they know when you're keenly interested in them. So I taught rather unconventionally. I never taught by the book, but as a, a teacher in an inner city urban school with many destination unknown kids, and I was a destination unknown kid, uh, <clears throat> you gotta have what I call, you gotta have game. Man, you gotta have game. You gotta be able to connect with these kids and meet them where they are. So that led uh, to many hilarious moments. It led to what I, we, we turned, we had a term in the military, we said, where you have a come to Jesus meeting. That's where, you know, you quietly take a kid out in the hall and the kids I told, I didn't say, will you please behave yourself? It, you know, we kind of talked in other ways. And I think that, uh, you know, so being also a martial arts instructor at that school, they was always saying, Mr. Smithy, show us this, show us that. And I would, no, 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 this okay, it's all right. No, 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 Shaw. So I always knew Dr. Shaw that there was, I, every, every teacher knows that one guy in the room who's sitting back there kind of sizing you up. You know, mm, you know and I was, okay, all right. So I would slowly take off my uh, sport coat, slowly take off my watch. And I would say, you, <laughs> come up here and all of a sudden you see their eyes light up like basketballs right and uh, so we and then we had fun with this it was it was great I love being around my students the but it wasn't all fun and games you asked about uh, a, a moment that stands out uh, I, there were plenty of uh, kids that I taught who uh, came from really, really bad places. And I could communicate with them or talk to them or put them in contact with a boxing coach downtown at the Crown Gym, or I shouldn't say this, pay a bill or two for, for their mom. That was oft times not around. I had uh, students who were pregnant and you're kind of helping them as, as a dad, you know, in my own right. Uh, and uh, there was uh, one day where um, there was a student who was usually, she was very effervescent, very uh, 
bright and she's just a bright light. And her head was down the entire class. And, you know, you got to have your antenna out. So instead of, excuse me, will you wake up? Come on, wake up. I, I just let her go. Something said, Frank, just, just let her go. And after the class ended and the kids were leaving the classroom, she picked her head up and, and she had tears. Just her mascara was almost down to her mouth. And I looked at her and I'm going, oh my God, well, I've long forgotten her name. And teachers are not supposed to have physical contact with their kids, but I didn't give a darn. This was a moment for me where you had to do more than just get on the phone and activate the social network, you know, to, you know, to call social services or, you know, she needed, uh, oh, she, but she needed, and I asked God at that time, I said, please give me the words, give me the words, this is, this is the moment. And, and she just came up to me and put her head on my shoulder, was bawling on my shoulder, and I asked her what was wrong. She had been in Detroit that weekend. This was a Monday. She had been raped by five different men. How she had the, the whatever to be in my classroom at eight o'clock in the morning is beyond me. And all I could think of what, you know, I felt so small and I felt so insignificant and so incapable that I guess this is where, you know, my faith comes in where, you know, you know, God puts you in and I'm not going to get milky about it, but sometimes, you know, why am I here? Why am I in this classroom? Why am I in front of these kids? I guess there was a reason for it. And, uh, and I was, I did whatever I could to comfort her. And, uh, no, I think, uh, Frank, I'll tell you one thing. The reason we brought you today on our Facebook Live is because not only you've been successful in every endeavor you have taken, but you are very passionate. You hold very high standards. You care about people, no matter what position you are put in. You yourself set as a role model. You know, you are not just all talk, but you walk also at the same time. And the thing I like about you is you are so personal. Well, I think uh, the way the way you talk to people immediately, students, your uh, fellow officers, your friends, your neighbors, make you feel like you are the family member. And I think that girl sharing with you, you know, one of the most tragic thing in the life speaks very high. So I think we are actually so much in gratitude for you to come and talk about your life because so many young people, including even person like me, and many of the older people will talk about it. You are a role model in every aspect of life. And that brings up the next uh, next question that now you are retired, you are into Medicare now, but you look like you are 30, 40 years old, you exercise every day. So let's cover a few pillars of healthy lifestyle. Let's start with eating. Uh, what kind of uh, food, what kind of diet do you have to look so good and to feel so good? Well, I'll pay you the $1,000 after we're done with this for giving me such good compliments, Dr. Shah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, discipline um, and goal setting to me, uh, these are part I, uh, of what I told my martial arts students years ago. I believe in what are called paradigm shifts. And a paradigm shift is a changing the way one thinks. And, and in our culture in the United States today, which moves at warp speed, um, this is in, this is out. This is what we feel about these people. Well, if you're over 50, you're over 60, well, you're, you're, yester you're so 20th century. You're yesterday's news, right? We don't wanna hear from you guys anymore. Well, you know, I, I can't change what they're thinking. All I can do uh, is be the best person I can be, and dag on it, they're going to see it. They're going to see it. And, and I'm not saying uh, I'm not full of myself. This is just how I approach it. So if it's a physical discipline, which I guess we'll get into, and now dietary, uh, there is a program uh, that I hooked into years ago by Bill Phillips. And uh, he uh, ran Experimental and Applied Sciences, uh, EAS. Uh, and uh, out of uh, Boulder, Colorado. And uh, I learned a lot about dieting, particularly, and, and you well know this, uh, the balance of uh, 
uh, proteins and carbohydrates. Uh, we need them both. And, you know, there's been a plethora of different, you know, the Scarsdale diet or the, you know, cutting out all carbs or this or that, don't eat eggs, it's bad for your heart, or now you can eat eggs, coffee's bad for you, but you know, sometimes coffee's good for you. Now, you know, so there's, there's a gargantuan amount of information out there, but I think that from my rather simplistic mindset on this, I think proteins and carbohydrates, the balance between the two are absolutely critical. So for me, as you well know, because you, you lived this, you're, you're an example to me, and uh, so, you know, I need fuel. So the carbohydrates will give me the fuel as long as I eat. And this is where Martha comes in. <laughs> she's, a, she's the size control police woman, you know. And, uh, and uh, so she governs my, uh, particularly with pasta. And so she, <laughs> she governs that. Um, I love Korean food and, and uh, but you know that so if I have to be careful with the pasta, I have to be careful with the sushi with the rice. Um, so you know there's a lot of things that I am, and my son Aaron is extremely smart on this, you know Aaron. And uh, so I, I get a lot of good coaching and a lot of good information from family members. And as far as the protein is concerned, uh, my training is very serious. Uh, not just my martial arts training, but my training, for instance, I was at the gym today. So when I work out, Dr. Shah, I try to balance uh, uh, my, what I call split routines uh, in which I work, if I go to the gym four times a week uh, or three times a week and one uh, extra day for cardio, on those three different days that I'm working with weight machines or free weights, uh, again, the discipline comes in where on split routines, I can work one day, uh, work my chest and my biceps. Or another day I could work my shoulders and my triceps. Or another day it could be back. Today was the worst day of all where I had to work my legs. And that's, that's a horrible day. Nobody likes that day. And, uh, and then you get your cardio in. So, you know, I think that when you go into any venture, you have to have a plan. So when you go into the gym, have a plan. When you're teaching in a classroom, you better have a plan. And sometimes plans change. So what's plan B or what's plan C or whatever, but you have to seamlessly move between those things. Uh, I taught Taekwondo at Everett High School for 15 years. I have a plan, you just can't wing this, you know? So, uh, you know, everything in life from the minute you get up to the minute you go to bed, have a goal, execute your goals. You can have good days, you can have bad days. If you have a bad day, flush it down the toilet, let it go, don't drool over it, just chalk it up, move on to the next thing. Otherwise, if you let your defeats or you let your, your, your temporary down times, if you let it get a hold of you, it can eat away at you and you, you just, you can't, I will not let it interfere with me. I want to be a senior bodybuilding champion by the time I'm in my 70s. That's what I'm working for. I'm working for physique. Uh, I'm working to be as not just fit. I was always fit, but I want to be cut. I want to, I, when I go into the gym, uh, nobody sees the color of my hair. The great equalizer, when I walk into a gym, Dr. Shaw at 67 years of age, the great equalizer, the doors that you have to go through to get into that gym. Once you're in there, you're, you're accepted. You know, is it, there's a, there's a etiquette, there's a, a culture of it. Everybody works together. Everybody has good coaching for each other. And you know, when we see someone, no matter what their age and they're there uh, who uh, have, you know, they, they need to shed a lot of weight or they seem like they're intimidated and you ask them, why are you intimidating? So I'm, I'm so intimidated by my surroundings here and everybody is so, and I, and if I love talking with these people and I say, you know what? Flush that down. We're happy you're here. You're here. That's the most important thing is that you're here. We, we all, everybody in here respects you. Don't look at what we're doing, you know, lifting all this stuff. Don't worry about it. You know, you're on the treadmill or you're on the elliptical. God bless you. You're here, man. That's, that's, 
that's what I love about it. Now, I think uh, you said in such a proper way that discipline and goal setting in life is so important. That applies to our health also. We have to make sure that we have the knowledge about healthy eating, including proper balance of all the macronutrients. We have to, we have to also have a support from our spouse of what we eat every day, I think because we go as a team. And I think same thing applies to physical activity and exercise. We have to have a game plan. We have to plan out our days. We have to make exercise and physical activity as a priority. We cannot be watching mindless TV and Netflix and yeah. the next day and not go to gym. We have to plan it out. And yeah. I think that brings the next pillar, which I think you follow very strictly, is the sleep. So tell us, because at the, as we get older, sleep becomes an issue. A lot of Americans at your age are not able to sleep soundly. And many of them, unfortunately, are on sleeping medications. So please tell us that how, how do you handle the sleep part when it comes down to sleeping soundly and being fresh next day to go to gym and follow all your goals? Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, some people need eight hours of sleep. I don't need eight hours. I usually sleep around between five and a half and six and I, I wake up feeling pretty, pretty rested. Uh, but you know what, I'll tell you something. I'm not a morning person, you know, <laughs> I eat breakfast. I think breakfast is important. I, you know, I, I struggle to the coffee pot, you know, and I make my, you know, curry and I drink my coffee and I don't know what galaxy I'm in for the first hour I'm awake. I mean, everybody knows that. Even when I was in a classroom, kids are going, leave him alone, <laughs> leave him alone, you know, before the first bell. And, uh, but anyway, uh, being a night owl, which I am, I still get to sleep uh, fairly easily. Um, the only thing that uh, bothers me, I've had uh, sports related surgery. So I've had two surgeries on my right shoulders and one on my left. And I've had five knee surgeries over the years. Uh, so, you know, these, these surgeries, even though, you know, they put Humpty Dumpty back together again at night for me, uh, if I sleep on my shoulder the wrong way and I, I'll wake up, and, you know, it takes me a while to get that out. But then I work it out. But I have no problem getting to sleep. And I have most of the time I have good nights of sleep, Dr. Shah. But when I wake up and um, I really do wake up after a cup of coffee and, you know, try not to watch the news, um, watch the sunrise and just kind of reflect on things. Uh, I feel good. I feel ready to go. But most of my training uh, in the afternoon, I, I don't, I don't for whatever reason. I guess it was all those years in the military where you had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and, and you know, by six o'clock, we had already, you know, worked a quarter of our day, you know, so I, I'm yeah. done with the morning. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that brings uh, something because we have this uh, six pillars of healthy lifestyle, which is obviously we talked about healthy eating, physical activity and sleep. And I also like to get an opinion from a wise person like you, that what is the importance of stress management at a personal level when it comes down to healthy living? Because I've never seen you stress. You're always happy, you're always jovial, you're always contributing to everybody's well-being. And that kind of a, almost like a nonstop, continuous happiness and joy requires a lot of work on a person's side. So please tell us, how do you stay so stress-free, always happy and always smiling? What are your tips? our viewers and our followers how to manage stress remember there's two things don't watch the news <laughs> that's number one and stay off of facebook <laughs> uh you know uh there's so much anger and, and whatnot if if uh if i find that i'm kind of getting sucked into it i pull back from it i i don't need that uh it it, it you know you're not going to change people's minds and they're going to change yours but the, the other thing is, is that I, I don't take myself too seriously. I'm a clown. I clown around a lot. There's a lot of self-deprecating humor. I don't mind either being the butt end of a joke or, or you're making, you know, self-deprecating on my own self. Uh, I love to play jokes. I'm a jokester, always have been. So uh, I might be 67 years old, but there is a 13-year-old boy still very much alive in me. Uh, breathing, breathing techniques are critical. <clears throat> my heart rate, my resting heart rate, I think is 61, 60 or 61. And my 
blood pressure last week was like 116 over uh, 74, 75 or something. So I'm very even, very calm. And I think that that comes from two things. Uh, my martial arts training and my, I'm also a shooting instructor. And uh, there are so many similarities between the two in terms of the application of it. You know, we're in a dangerous world today. So if I, you know, teaching my students martial arts, it was never, you know, martial sport in my class. It was about the art. It was how do you apply it in terms of self-defense? And when you hit that critical moment, when you have to protect yourself or protect your, your, your family member or your girlfriend, whomever, uh, how do you respond in that moment when your physiological responses, you know, the deer in the headlight kind of thing that they talk about, and uh, same thing with defending yourself with a handgun legally in many states, uh, where your, your responses, the fight or flight responses in which the tactile uh, functions leave your, your extremities for your fine motor skills and blood begins to pool down uh, in the center because what your body is doing is preparing for trauma. And so I would tell, tell my students and those whom I instruct on shooting ranges that to maintain calm requires training in breathing techniques. So uh, the Koreans call it uh, Tansan breathing. And, and, and you know, Grandmaster Zhong Ri and others will talk about how these techniques would help to cleanse your body of impurities or whatever else. So I don't know about that. I'm not gonna deny that. But what it does, it puts you in a very peaceful place. So what, what the, the exercise that I have my, all my students do, even to this day, is I have them inhale. They're, they're sitting, you pick a nice quiet place, and you're sitting in a sort of a modified lotus position. And your hands are on your thighs. Posture is absolutely critical. So you want to straight back. Your eyes are closed. And I would, with my martial arts students, it was always when we did this, Dr. Shaw, at the end of our workout. So they're sweating. I mean, I did this on purpose. And I would say, concentrate, if there was an airflow system on the, on the ceiling or whatever, I said, to the exclusion of everything else, students coming in and out, watching what we're doing, this is part of your training. You need to be able to block all the garbage out. You need to block it out. Concentrate on an airflow system. Right, that's all I want you to do. And I said, I'm going to do a count for you. And the first four seconds of that count, you inhale. And then you'll hold it for eight seconds. And then you'll exhale for four seconds. So I would do the count, three cycles of it. And if a kid, you know, sweat coming down and I see him move his hand to, or her hand to try to wipe, nope, nope. Keep, you know, this is the discipline. So kind of like optimizing the hard drive on your computer, there is so much garbage that's in our heads, dangling files that mean absolutely nothing, all the stresses and everything that does just uh, interfere with your ability to function. So by doing these breathing exercises what it, and doing them faithfully every day, what it does, Dr. Shaw, it creates a state in which uh, and I'm not talking about myself, just saying in general, where in times of uh, re something really bad happening around you, where you will be hopefully the calmest person in the room. And when you're able to control your physio physiological responses to the stress, and you have to, just like going into the gym and working out or working a sidekick and whatever, you know, you have to train this, you have to practice this. It has to become second nature so that God forbid something happens, you know, uh, all the things that you learned in training when you start all of a sudden, when you, it all goes haywire in your head and you panic, the thing that you trained over and over and over again, all of a sudden you, you drop your gun or you, you, you're fumbling. That's because you have lost your physiological control to stress. And that, will get you hurt 
or in a bad case like we see with violent crime, it could get you killed. So these are these are beautiful no, I exercises. Think that, I think those are some of the excellent suggestions that I firmly believe in also, you know, learning some kind of breathing techniques, you know, and those could be something as simple as just sitting and observing your breath or focusing on a thought. I mean, there are various ways of doing it, but everybody, in my opinion, should learn how to have a certain breathing techniques, also learn how to meditate in a certain way. And I think also learn how to handle the stress while you know while you are going through low level of stress. I think you have to train yourself by we call it negative visualization, where mm -hmm. actually you play out the scenarios in your head and you act out in those playing out the scenarios in the head, how would you behave? So I think playing out those scenarios are also very important. And I think stoic philosophy clearly says that imagine yourself that you are in a shooting site and see how would you act and how would you behave? And then you practice that self in your head and you'd be prepared better. You know, I mean, those are all great suggestions, but let me ask you the last pillar of health, being healthy and happy. And that pillar which you have mastered very well, and that's a relationship. You know, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a neighbor, you know, as a as a just a, a, a community person, please teach us how do you manage all this relationship you have in such a marvelous way. Please give us some tips. I, I just like people, Dr. Shah. I like people. And uh, when I was a young kid, um, coming from a sort of a bad place, uh, I had confidence issues. And and again. Uh, it was sports gave me a way out. Um, and so did when I was in the military, started taking college classes. I didn't have a, I did not have one college credit to my name when I went into the military at uh, almost 18 years of age. So all of these things that people helped me, whether they were mentors or my relationship with, you know, my friends in the military who we were from all different walks of life and, and all colors and all backgrounds. Um, I just, I thought to myself, wow, this is neat. This is neat. I love being around these people. We all have something in common. So anyway, what does that translate to? It translates to the fact that I just love being around people. I love the inter interaction. Um, you know, everybody has a different personality. And I think we all have our uh, awareness as to certain people where you ought not, you know, they're not receptive to it. Or, and that's okay, because we're all different. Other people are more amiable, more friendly, you know. So, I mean, it's kind of a flow, you know, you kind of flow. And, and uh, you know, I just... Uh, I just, I just love the interaction with certainly tonight and, and being at gatherings with you and Jake, Karen and John and my family is now Karen and John and the McDermott and Bowman families up there in Michigan. Um, I just, I, I, I just get high on being around people. I just love being around people and I try not to, you know, I, 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 I try to be as real as I can. There's, I, I don't, this, what you see with me is what you get. No, I think uh, I think you said in such a right way. At the same time, I realized that you know in relationship, it's definitely a give and take uh, discipline. I think okay. you have to give unconditional love. You have to spend your resources unconditionally. You have to provide them care, and then you will receive them. I think uh, there are people who unfortunately are not willing to give that unconditional resources and care and love to other people, and they expect to receive it. I think person like you who has on this relationship basis, partly because you give this kind of a care and love and resources unconditionally to people. So that's a big lesson for all of us that, you know, mimic and, and kind of imitate the people who are good at relationship, see how they function in the group, love the people, you know, respect them, regardless of their economic background, regardless of their race or color yeah. or nationality, just respect yeah. every human being. And I think you you are a kind of a shining example. That brings my kind of a touchy subject because I'm not very familiar with it, is about the Second Amendment. So please tell us your views on Second Amendment. I know you are a great, responsible, you know, very, very careful gun owner. So please teach some of uh, our followers and viewers that what is the importance of Second Amendment as American and how can a person be a responsible gun owner? You know, there, 
this is such a a hot button issue in in American uh, uh, discourse today, and and uh, it's unfortunate that that something like this, just like about anything else we can talk about as an issue, automatically becomes a blue versus red, you know, a left versus right. Uh, you know, there are, I have people with whom I worked in the past in education who are liberals and that's fine. I'm still friends and we will never agree on things but they're still my friends. And I have people uh, who are shooters and second amendment people on the right. I think Dr. Shah, what the problem is, is the extremes, the people who are on the political extremes who are not open to what the other side is saying. For instance, um, I believe that the Second Amendment, and, and, and I respect those who will disagree with me, but I think that uh, our founding fathers uh, were uh, knowledgeable and aware through their own experiences of uh, what tyranny uh, was like. And tyranny was, you know, was put on us by various acts by uh, Parliament and uh, King George. And everybody knows about the Stamp Act and uh, all these other types of things. But uh, uh, nonetheless, the amendment is there. Now, without getting into how, how it's interpreted, you know, do, is, it, is it against if the government comes into, oh, my God, we're going to be ready? I, I don't think about that. All I think about is this is a beautiful country that guarantees me a right to responsibly own a firearm. Now, that having been said, that's my base right there. I'm a responsible gun owner. When I see the arguments today from uh, many people on the left, I understand what they're saying. There are many young kids in homes who are killed senselessly by folks who Oft, many, 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 many times they think they're responsible and they leave a stupid gun on the counter, a fully loaded gun. And, and uh, we had something uh, in Michigan, as you probably well remember a few years ago, where a young boy in elementary school shot a, uh, one of his classmates. Uh, and he, they had had a tiff like young kids always do, first grade or whatever. But he lived in a house where there was not a responsible gun owner and he saw a gun on the counter, brought that gun to school and shot and killed that young girl. I think this kid was six and he shot another kid who was six. So those are tragedies to me that are so horrible, so horrible. I see what's going on in Chicago. Uh, so I understand that there is a need to tighten up, even though the laws are in the books, I think that there are things that we can do better to make sure that firearms don't fall into uh, uh, the improper hands, whether they be at gun shows and gun show loopholes and what they call straw purchases, people who purchase for other people who don't qualify to be able to have a firearm. There are many instances where we can clean it up, but there is another side. Uh, the folks on the left that I know, if they see an AR-15, and I and and I'll say that's an assault weapon, and I will say okay, you know, because I love to discuss, and I say, well, what in your mind makes it an assault weapon? Well, it's used for the military. Well, it's not used for the military. It's on the civilian market. It's not an automatic weapon. It shoots one shot at a time. What else makes it scary? Well, it's black and it's plastic. Okay. And I would say, here's this other hunting rifle. It's got nice wood stock on it, a scope on it. And you put a picture of that over a picture of an AR. I said, now, what other differences? Well, this one's plastic. And it's used for assault purposes. And I go, assault? I know so many people. Have I, I don't remember anybody that I know going around assaulting. But you know what? You can take that hunting rifle and you can do the same thing. That hunting rifle with the wooden stock on it. These are both rifles. There's no difference between the two. So I have had, thankfully, I've had people, my liberal friends who have said, you know what, thank you. I did not know that. 
Now, I know there's other people, no matter what, you know, I'm saying right now, it won't make a difference. And that's fine. I'm not going to try to change it. But I think that you can be me. I can be a good ambassador for uh, the shooting sports or if necessary, you know, if that's what they want to learn how to, uh, you know, do personal protection with their fire. I, tr I teach those both. Uh, I was a person up in uh, Michigan before moving down here. I was the person that people going for their concealed licenses, they had to get past me on the range to get their license. So you get your lawyer and your good classroom stuff downstairs, but you had to go upstairs to the range and that's, that's where they saw me. And even at that point, Dr. Shaw, it was always a teaching moment for me. I'm, I'm an eternal teacher. And uh, so I, I love being able I think, to do uh, that. That's a, that's a great uh, balanced explanation. And I think uh, there's always going to be two sides to every yes. story and every law and everything. And I think uh, that's just the nature of democracy. And I think we actually are doing great as a democracy because there are two sides to every amendment, yes. every law. So I think it makes sense. At the same time, I think we need people like you who understands the argument from other side and yeah. is willing to ban and willing to modify approaches mm -hmm. which our country needs to take because we are no longer two or 300 years ago. I mean, we are into a different era now. And I think uh, you know there are different influences. So I think uh, I'm sure there is a happy medium where everybody is satisfied. And I think it just requires, you know, like you said, not the two extreme sides. I think it needs people like you who are in the center and mm -hmm. try to, you know, understand the law, how to modify for current needs, and you know, and then be done with it. I think there is no reason. To, I think to me, this has become almost like a, a political football where yes. personal and party advantage, both sides keep throwing back at each other yes. instead of coming to the consensus. I think longer this issue stays alive, more some of the some of the interested parties will benefit i think uh, they are doing it in my opinion is to keep this issue going forever but this issue can be resolved if people like you are on the table instead of the two extremists so you know that brings a uh, last can one I, can, I say, can i say one thing yes can I say just one thing um there was an incident in texas in 1991 when i was stationed in fort hood in which the memory of this is so seared into my head in which uh, Martha and I were on our way to a cafeteria it's in Texas, it's called Luby's and it's a big, big uh, chain of cafeterias. And we ate there all the time. And, but she was on call, I had just got back from an exercise and, and she was on call, but this is when I had pagers. So we didn't have cell phones in 1991. So I said, let's go to Luby's. And she said, can we eat somewhere just a little bit closer? Okay. We would have been at Luby's by maybe 10 minutes to 12, Dr. Shaw. Uh, but we ate someplace else. When we got home, she got a message. You know what stat is. So stat is all hands on deck. Yeah. I'm used to it. She, she does this all the time. Stat, stat, stat. So just, it's okay. Martha's out on the job. She called me back. Uh, 20 minutes later from the hospital. And she said, turn on the TV, the local Waco, Texas station, Dr. Shaw was now the national feed. By the time we would have been there, this man, I've forgotten his name, drove his Ford F-150 pickup truck through the glass windows of that restaurant, got out. He had two nine millimeter pistols. He had bandoliers of nine millimeter ammunition. And he started shooting. He started shooting. My chiropractor, Suzanne Gracia Huck, uh, her, she was there with her elderly parents. And the man put his firearm, uh, the, the, her parent, her father, almost 80 years old, tried to do what he could. He was helpless and he was shot twice in the chest. The man then put his firearm, pointed it at her mother in her 70s. She put her head on her uh, husband's shoulder and he shot her in the head. He then pointed the firearm at Suzanne and it went click. There were no more rounds left in that firearm. So he dropped the magazine from that firearm, took a new magazine out, put it in, 
wrapped around into the chamber and went to the next table. And she said to me, and we were friends, and she said to me, Frank, in the instant that he did that act of changing magazines, she goes, I could have taken him, but I was obeying the law. There were no cops in the place. It was a shooting gallery. I could have taken him, she said, but I was obeying the law. So late that night, it was, it was an eerie scene. They had 22 hearses. You had to leave the bodies in, it's a crime scene. They had 22 hearses, Dr. Shar parked end to end, and it was flood lit, lit and everything else. And I'm thinking to myself, Mary, mother of God, I could have been in one of those hearses, but for a last second decision. So it doesn't make a difference how big we are, how tough we are, how prepared we think we are. If it's your time and you're not prepared, uh, you're going to go. That, that gun is, is a, a tremendous uh, uh, equal, not an equalizer. In, in the case of the, this George Hennard guy, I think that was his name, he had the distinct advantage. And it doesn't make a difference who you are. You were going to get shot and you were going to get killed. So yes, sir, I have firm feelings about these things from an experience that I will never forget. I'm glad I'm here talking with you right now. But for a last second decision, I probably would not have been. There were 22 killed and 39 injured, many of them critically. They were triaging, choppers sending people to medical centers in the area all over the place. And I'll never forget it. But that governs my thought. It governs my whole uh, approach to this. I am deadly serious when it comes to these types of things. Very I think that's a, that's a, that's a, I think a very appropriate example you gave us that I think, uh, you know, there are right reasons to you know, protect yourself. And I think protecting yourself involves, uh, you know, owning a gun or taking a martial art training or staying physically fit, you know, whatever way. But I think we all should be prepared for all these unfortunate scenarios because this kind of instances are going on for thousands of years. It's not something new. And I think every person has to learn how to fight in this kind of scenario in a proper way. You cannot be frozen. You cannot be, you know, you know, kind of running away from this thing. You have to stand up. And yeah. if you do, you will take, you will protect yourself. Will you protect your family? You will yeah. protect people who are at the site. And I think, like you said, many times police has a time to come, and you are the only, you know, only person standing between really bad thing happening. And I think person like you you know, can, can teach us that how to be that person. So that brings my final question that, uh, you know, we all have learned from you so much today. I mean, you are a wise man. You are an accomplished man. You have played so many important roles in our society, in our community. You are a great friend, you know, great, just a great person. So please tell us what kind of books you have read. Give us top three books so we know where you get your knowledge, where you get your wisdom. Uh, wow. <clears throat> I'm a student of, of history, and I think history is a great teacher. I think we can learn from it. And one of my favorite authors, wow, is Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, Doris Kearns was a, uh, she's still alive. Uh, she was uh, Lyndon Johnson's biographer when he was, uh, after he left the White House. And actually, he gave Doris Kearns at that time access to him in the West Wing. And, and so, the, you know, she wrote a lot about him in various uh, things, uh, platforms. But she wrote a book, uh, uh, No Ordinary Time. And what it does, what, what, No Ordinary Time by Doris Kearns Goodwin is follows Franklin Roosevelt in World War II when he had to make critical decisions. And here's this man afflicted by polio, um, his heart was in such a bad state that, and you're a cardiologist, so you would appreciate this, um, how he lived even to the age that he did is, is beyond anybody's imagination. His blood pressure was through the roof and he was just, uh, he had a lot, so many th th negative things going on physically. So Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, is uh, one. Um, Anton Myrer wrote a book, uh, it's a novel, <clears throat> oftentimes referred to uh, in the Army War College and military schools 
called, it, 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 they refer to it as America's War and Peace. And it's called Once an Eagle. And Once an Eagle transformed uh, me in many ways. I read the book and later on, uh, my favorite actor is Sam Elliott. And Sam Elliott in 1977, I think it was part of a miniseries on TV. And he played a, uh, an enlisted man uh, who was driven to become an officer. And Sam Elliott, uh, his character, Sam Damon, was kind of a guy that when you talk about role models and who you try to fashion yourself after, here's this fictional character played by this actor who just looked like a man's man to me. And, uh, you know, I thought, that's, that's what it is right there. That's, that's my, that's the way I am. That's all I have to do is do what Sam Damon does, right? And uh, I felt so motivated and so inspired by that, that it, it kind of prevent, uh, prevented, presented me kind of a way where I could just literally bust through the wall and do it, you know? And, uh, and it happened to me. So I guess maybe I became Sam Damon in a way. Uh, the other thing, uh, a book I'm making my way through right now is, uh, especially in these times that we're in, it's so apropos, is Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. And, and uh, I think I read this way back yonder, you know, decades and decades ago, whatever. But I'm reading it again now. And uh, I'm so taken by how brave she was to write this work at a time during the antebellum period before <clears throat> the Civil War, when slavery was such a hot button issue. And I was talking to Martha about this before, Dr. Shaw, the way people wrote 100 years ago, the quality of the writing, the use of language. I am absolutely mesmerized. We, we think, oh my God, 100 years ago, it's the Stone Ages, but it's really not. And I quite frankly, Dr. Shaw, where we are today as a country, just my personal feeling, if we went back even 60 years almost to 1960, I saw a picture in uh, a magazine the other day uh, it was written in 19, so was, the picture was taken in, it was an art picture. The world, or it was America in 2020. And what it showed were people living individually in these little capsules. And they were like almost robotic. And that was what life was going to be in 2020 in the 21st century and whatever. Obviously, we're not. Obviously, they're, they're, we're no further along. If we can have cell phones. We have so many different things technologically. Wow. But look at the human condition today. We're not any better than we were. And quite frankly, I don't think people from those days would be terribly impressed with us if they saw what we are like. If they could come to see us where we are today, I don't think they would be very impressed with us at all. I don't think we've advanced very far socially or in terms of caring for other people. If anything, we've gotten more aloof from what other people are going through around us. I think that uh, that's just my two cents. I won't go any further into it. I just no. don't think that people are, would be very impressed with where we are as a people or as a country today. Yeah, I think, uh, I, think I agree with you. And I think uh, that brings kind of an opportunity to you know, us, both of us and all of us that, you know, we try to be the role model of yeah, a, yeah. what a, a gentle human being should be, what a, a good citizen should be, not just to America, but to the world. And I think if we, if we read more about our past, learn from it, and I think we try to, you know, improve ourselves on a daily basis, and that includes with our health, you know, yeah. definitely health in the last 60 years has really gone down. I mean, obesity is about 42% of Americans are obese. We are not exercising. You know, 25% are antidepressant. A lot of broken families, a lot of, uh, you know, unfortunate teenage pregnancy. You know, so a lot yeah. of things are kind of a bad side effect of this progress. But I think that's where we need people like you. And I think I'm going to take myself in the same role that we need to spread the good things about human being and see if we can teach people that progress 
should happen not just in terms of technology but also in terms of humanity in terms totally. of environment in terms of our earth in terms of animal suffering and animal cruelty i mean all those progress are not exclusive of each other we don't have to progress in one area and regress in other areas i think we are smart enough and we are actually capable as americans that we can progress in all the areas simultaneously and we can lead the world i think if we don't do that we will be another roman or greek civilization who came and went away i think we probably will go away even faster than those two civilizations so i think uh, i i'm reading this parik zakaria's book about the post america something i think he has a great book about how we as american continue to lead the world and i think that's where some of the current situations i think we need to make sure that we vote every time we choose the right person not the party necessarily and we do our civic duties to make sure america continue to be the leader in the world and yeah. we need people like you so i'm so glad i'm so thankful for you to come tonight to show how to live a life how to be a role model and like i said being in a military and being a teacher those two i put at one of the highest sparrow in terms of how a community service can be done and you have done both of them so i'm very proud of you we will be bringing you back again to hear your progress in a six months or a year to see how to age gracefully how to be always smiling and happy and you know joking around so next time you come we're going to have a one or two jokes from you so thank you frank and have a great evening say hello to martha say hello to your kids and i'll also make sure john and karen knows that we were together thank yeah, you yeah and maybe we'll see you this christmas huh you this christmas for sure yes yes thank you. you thank you